It's good to see all of you. It's been a while. It's always such a great joy to get to be here and, and uh, an honor to stand in this pulpit. I'm told that uh, those who are physically here in this assembly uh, comprise about 20% of the number uh, that you would ordinarily have here before the coronavirus went on a rampage. But I'm also told that there are something like 700 people who are streaming this service. And uh, so a hello to all of you as well. And a special uh, personal hello, if I may, to Anita and Coco in Fort Washington, Maryland, and to Dee Dee in Detroit. I hope that those of you who are uh, isolated at home in families are getting along. Uh, you know, this is a little more togetherness than you're ordinarily used to. Someone sent me some notes the other day, notes that children wrote to God. I thought one of them might be especially appropriate for what's going on right now. It was a note from a little girl. Her name was Nan. And this is what she wrote. Dear God, I bet it's very hard for you to love everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can't do it. <laughs> so I hope you're getting along. Those of you who are here, I see that uh, some of you have found your seats of choice. You're sitting in the same places that you always sat. And uh, when I was preaching for the church in Amarillo, the central church, I had a, an elder there. His name was Roy Carver. He was a wonderful man. Roy and Stella his wife always sat in exactly the same place. Those were their places. Roy was a gentle man. He was a kind man. But if he got there and somebody was sitting in his seat, Stella's seat, he would gently ask them to move. One of the things that he could not do was remember names. I don't know if you have any problem with that. Roy could not remember names. Sometimes he could not remember faces. And as a result, he was introducing himself to the same people over and over again, Sunday after Sunday. We had a young couple that came there and became part of that church. Uh, this young man was a firecracker. He was enthusiastic. He was energetic. He was a lot of fun. Roy Carver introduced himself to him several Sundays in a row. And finally one day this young man, his name was Buddy Chestnut, he said, uh, Brother Carver, I like you a whole lot. I want you to like me, but you're not going to be able to like me if you don't know me. I want you to know my name, I want you to know my face, and I want you to stop introducing yourself to me. He said, my name is Buddy Chestnut, Buddy Chestnut. And he said, I want you to say it. Brother Carver said, Buddy Chestnut. He said, say it again. He said, Buddy Chestnut. He had him do it three or four times, and he said, next Sunday I'm going to see you, and I want you to know me, and I want you to know my name, and I want you to say my name. Brother Carver said, okay. The next Sunday, Buddy checked him out. He said, Brother Carver, do you know who I am? Brother Carver said, yes. He said, what's my name? He said, uh, you're some kind of a nut. <laughs> so if anybody happens to get your seat, maybe, maybe that'll handle it. I want to tell you about another elder of mine. Uh, Dr. Bill Rogers was one of my elders at the Broadway Church in Lubbock. 
he was a fanatic. I'm skeptical about fanatics, and I usually try to distance myself from them. I was even doing that before the coronavirus. But I was drawn to Bill's fanaticism. I didn't see any flaw in it. I greatly admired it because, you see, Bill was a fanatic about heaven and about getting other people to heaven. He ended every single public prayer the same way. He would say, Father, more than anything, we want to go to heaven when we die. Every single time. His agenda was singular. He wanted to get people to heaven. In elders' meetings, he ran every single decision for his vote through a single filter. Will this help people get to heaven? You know, I loved that man, and he's been gone a long time. I still miss him. But I am so glad that I was one of the sheep in his care. It's not that I am unconcerned about buildings and budgets. But I need a leader, I want a leader, who is fanatically concerned about my soul, who is fanatically concerned about getting me to heaven. You are such a fortunate church because you have that kind of leadership. Your elders, your preacher, everybody that's in a role of leadership that I've met here is fanatically concerned about getting you to heaven. And you're fortunate to have that kind of leadership. Uh, by the way, Ken Stegall is uh, responsible for the sermon that I'm preaching here today because in one of the messages that he did in that faith series, and wasn't that an incredible series, uh, I heard every one of those messages, and I was challenged, and I was blessed when uh, Chef Stegall hands you a meal from this pulpit, you eat well. I don't know of a church anywhere that's as well fed as this one is. Uh, just week in and week out, Stegall does it every single time. In one of those messages, he, he closed that message with a passage from 1 Timothy chapter 4 which said, Godliness has value for everything, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And when he said that, I said that morning, because I'd already been invited to be here on this day when he and Janice would be in Louisiana for their grandson's wedding. Uh, I decided at that moment that I wanted to build a sermon about heaven and deliver that sermon here today. So don't blame Ken for the content or for the presentation, just for the idea. You know, the last chapter in a person's life holds a very special interest for us. We want to know what was on that person's mind when time was running out, when the last chapter was about to come to a close, and when they were about to sign off with those two words, the end, what were they thinking about? When Jesus had that Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room, he was rapidly moving toward the end. It was just hours away. As a matter of fact, you think about this, he had already seen his last sunset before his death. What was he thinking? What was he concerned about? He wasn't so concerned about the coming death, although you know from the garden scene that he dreaded that. But the main thing he was concerned about was his disciples. More than anything, he wanted to make sure that those disciples got to heaven. John chapter 13 
opens with the words, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. John chapters 13 through 17, those five chapters, 13 through 17, consist of Jesus' goodbye to these disciples who had been the closest to him during these last years of his life. These five chapters encompass two things, the Passover meal in the upper room and the trek to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a time of confusion and fear and grief for these earthly companions of his. I think chapter 13 especially lays out the reasons for their turmoil. In verse 21, he foretells the betrayal of Judas when he says, one of you is going to betray me. In uh, verse 38, he confronts Peter with that horrible truth that he's going to disown him three times before the sun comes up again. And a little bit later in chapter 16, he tells them that all of them are going to abandon him. He said, you will leave me all alone. Can you imagine how that made them feel? With the almost unbearable weight of what was being said here. He had something else to say to them. Because the unbearable weight was this, and I think this is the main thing that caused them to be so distressed. In verse 33 of chapter 13, he made an announcement to them, I will be with you only a little longer. I will be with you only a little longer. How do you think that hit them? With the almost unbearable announcement that he made there, chapter 14 opens with those words that you saw a little while ago. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. But people, their hearts were troubled, deeply troubled. Peter had once said to him, Lord, we have left everything to follow you, and they had. They had abandoned their occupations. They had left the pleasantries of home to follow him. They had fervently believed that he was going to establish an earthly kingdom and that he was going to destroy Roman rule and that he was going to restore the glory days of Israel. And now he's telling them that he's leaving them. How can they feel? He's talking to men who are crushed. They have sunk their boats and blown up their bridges, so to speak, and now he's telling them he's going away and they cannot follow him. Not now. So they're experiencing an unspeakable anxiety. Their whole world has been wrapped up in him and the prospect of his departure and leaving them alone is devastating. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he said. Now, people, that statement is useless unless you finish the sentence. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Ken drilled that into us over and over again, pointing out that in days like these that we're living in, trust in him is the only solution you have to a troubled heart, the only solution. Trust in God, trust in me. The marginal reading in the NIV says you trust in God, trust also in me. They had believed in him. 
They had trusted him. And now they're thrown off balance by his approaching death and his departure, and he's asking them to trust in him even if they don't understand. To walk by faith and not by sight through the darkness of what's about to happen. I want you to have the same trust in me, he's saying to them, that you have in God. Yes, I am going away for a while, but it's for a purpose. I'm going away to prepare a place for you so that we can be together forever. They thought that if he left them, they lost him. And he's telling them that's not so. That he wants them to trust him now to deliver on the promise that he's going to prepare a place for them and that he's going to come back and get them and take them to be with him forever. And he said to them, if it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, if this separation that we're going to experience is a forever thing, I would have told you that. I've been straight with you when I enlisted you and said, follow me. I was not being deceptive. I was not gambling on the fact that this kingdom thing may or may not work out. If what I am now promising you that I am going to prepare a place and I'm going to come back and get you and take you to be with me forever, if that was just pie in the sky, I would have told you that. I've been truthful with you. I would never give you false hope. If there was any chance that your commitment to me was going to melt into misery, I would have warned you about that. I would have told you about that. Some seemingly bad things are about to happen. Some really bad things are about to happen. There's going to be a gruesome crucifixion tomorrow morning. And I'm going to die. And I'm going to leave you for a while. I don't want you to let that shatter your faith and your trust in me. I am not going to abandon you. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms. What's the Father's house going to be like? What's heaven going to be like? I don't really know. I'm sure that you have wondered about that. There isn't a whole lot in your Bible that describes heaven. There are a few things that talk about what's there and about what's not there. The Apostle John in the Revelation wrote a little bit about a vision that he was given of heaven. He said it's, it's like a city. It's like a square. Uh, actually, more like a cube. And he gave the dimensions of it. He said it's 1,500 miles long. 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles high. You know, 1,500 miles is the distance from Houston to Los Angeles. If John's figures here are literal instead of figurative, and incidentally, I've looked at a lot of commentaries on this, I've found only one commentator that says it's hyperbole. All the rest of them just accept it for what it says. If those figures are right, heaven is huge. You know, if you think you've seen a tall building, you may want to rethink that. You know, the tallest building in the world is in Dubai. It's 2,717 feet high. That's approximately a half mile. Now, if John's dimension are correct, heaven is 3,000 times that. The tallest building in Texas is in downtown Houston. You've probably seen it, the J.P. Morgan Chase Tower. It's 1,002 feet tall. 
If John's figures are correct, heaven is 7,900 times that. From here to the space station, 254 miles. Heaven does that six times. I don't know about you, I can't get my mind wrapped around that. And some of the other things that John says about heaven, about it resting on this, these enormous foundations of all of these beautiful different stones. And then he talks about 12 gates, huge gates. And each one of them is made, he says, out of a solid pearl, one pearl. And he talks about a street of gold. Now, I have never in my life experienced anything anywhere close to that, so it's beyond my comprehension. It's totally beyond my comprehension. Now, when he talks about what's not there, I have a limited comprehension of that because he says there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And Jesus adds, it'll be a place where thieves don't come in and steal your stuff. Now, I have some comprehension of that. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've conducted a lot of funerals for some very good friends. I know what it is to mourn. I know what it is to cry. I have had some limited pain, not like most people have, but some limited amount of pain, and I lock my doors. Now, in heaven, you will never lock a door, and you will never shed a tear, and you will never visit the sick, and you will never attend a funeral, and you will never go to the emergency room, and you'll never have a prescription filled. John says none of those things are going to be there. Well, since the Bible doesn't give us much of an overall picture of heaven, we probably shouldn't stray too much into that territory. Uh, Paul wouldn't do that. Paul said that, I know a man, and apparently he was talking about himself. He said, I know a man who was caught up into the third heaven. He said, whether that was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. But he said that he was caught up into paradise and he heard things that a man is not permitted to tell. Wonder why. You know, we don't know how many people Jesus raised from the dead. We have a record of only three, a widow's only son, a synagogue ruler's only daughter, and a couple of ladies' only brother. Those three were raised from the dead by Jesus and they came back to life. And did you know not a single one of those three said a single word about what was on the other side? You think maybe that was for our benefit? Maybe for our benefit because God knew that once we really got a grip on what it was like there, the last place we'd want to stay would be here. Peter said, it's an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. And Paul said, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Some translations have it, in my Father's house are many mansions. Mansions is a bit misleading, I think, in terms of uh, our modern conception. Rooms may be as well. The original thing just said dwelling places. That's what you had on your screen here. Dwelling places, lodging places. And most exegetes say that it means a single dwelling unit. And I'm attracted to that, and I'll tell you why I'm attracted to that. Mansion doesn't interest me in the least. I've toured the Bishop's Palace and the Moody Mansion in Galveston. You probably have too. Interesting, historically. I wouldn't want to live in either one of those. Uh, 
I have visited the Winchester Mansion in San Jose, California. And I'll tell you, it would creep me out to spend one night in that place, much less live there. The term rooms, frankly, doesn't appeal very much to me. That sounds kind of like a dormitory, uh, a retirement center, an assisted living complex, or something like that. But when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and the CEV says, I'm going to prepare a place for each of you, I can get excited about that. I can get really excited about that. In heaven, there are many dwelling places, and one of them prepared just for you. You like your home, don't you? It's your place. No place like home. And you're comfortable there. You have your own bed. You sleep on the same side every time, don't you? You have your own pillow, don't you? and your own chair. And you sit at the same place at the table when you have your meals every time, don't you? And you have your own favorite coffee cup and your favorite comfort clothes, your sweatpants and t-shirt or whatever your grunge of choice may be. I'd be surprised if you hadn't at some time or another been a little uncomfortable thinking about the adjustments that you'll have to make to leave that place that's so comfortable to you and go to another place, even if it's called heaven. When we move from one location to another here, there are adjustments that have to be made. We have to adjust to an unfamiliar city, an unfamiliar neighborhood, an unfamiliar shopping area, an unfamiliar church. And when we think of the things that we've heard about heaven and the pictures that we've seen, you know, when I was a child in Sunday school, they gave us those little cards. None of you here are old enough to remember that, but they gave us little cards. And they would have a beautiful picture on it and a scripture verse. And the one about heaven had somebody floating on a cloud and wearing a robe and a crown and strumming a harp. That didn't appeal to me too much. But having my own place does. All of that's fantasy. He has a place for you. He knows your tastes. He knows your likes, your dislikes. He knows your favorite things. He knows your least favorite things. He would not prepare a place for you that wouldn't be to your liking. You'd be perfectly comfortable. You're not going to have to make any adjustments. And your place, if some of these translations are accurate, your place isn't going to be like anybody else's. It's not going to be prefab. It's not going to be cookie cutter. It's going to be especially designed for you and there aren't going to be any unpleasant neighbors and no leaky faucets and no family conflicts and no temper tantrums and no crabby dispositions and no harsh words and no feelings of being unappreciated. You know, Peter asked Jesus when he said he was going away, Peter asked Jesus, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow now. He said, you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, before the sun came up again, Peter had failed that test. But that was only a temporary lapse. Uh, the remainder of his remarkable life was a testimony to the depth of his commitment. And when Peter said, I will lay down my life for you, I have no reason to doubt that he was saying, I had rather die with you than live without you. I want you to watch the prepositions here. 
I would rather die with you than live without you. And people, you know by what Jesus did the next morning, what he said, I'd rather die for you than live without you. Jesus' aim is to get you to heaven. He said in talking to these disciples, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So he's preparing a place for you. You're not going to go there as a stranger. You're going to go there as one whose coming is expected and whose dwelling is ready. That place is going to be ready for you if for any reason you're not ready for that place. This would be a really good time to take care of that while we stand together and sing.